Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, acclaimed LA session drummer, producer, and composer, Denny Fongheiser. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from Music City, USA, Nashville, Tennessee. And usually I have a co-host, Mr. Jim McCarthy. If you guys follow the show, he's a hobbyist drummer, longtime friend of mine, killer voiceover artist. You guys check out JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. But we're going to get right into it today. This is long overdue. We have a million mutual friends. We play the same drums. Uh, hailing, coming from Santa Monica, California, our new friend Denny Fongheiser. How are you, man? Good. How are you? Oh, good. Let me just get these uh, cheap J uh, Jeff Bezos readers off. I buy them like in bulk, like, you know, six at a time. And it's never enough because there's one in the car, yeah. one in the shirt. Yeah. One in the back. <laughs> I, I used to do that, too. And then I had to graduate to full on glasses. Yeah, uh, man. But yeah, I uh, yeah. Every room had had a had a pair of glasses. Yeah, it? man. It just it just happens. You hit 40 and it's like, here you go, kid. Uh, but I refuse to like tie him around my neck. You know, I'm just not doing yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I will not go quietly into the night. So, so uh, you know, we interview a lot of, you know, thought leaders, authors, comedians, musicians, drummers, a mm -hmm. lot of drummers. And uh, if you guys, um, just man, if you haven't had your head in the sand here for the last 40 years, what a storied career. These are just some of the folks that Denny has played with heart. Tracy Chapman, Counting Crows, Seal, Peter Frampton, John Paul Jones, Bruce Springsteen, the Lion King soundtrack, the theme song to Friends, the list goes on and on. Congratulations, brother. I mean, this is a dream. This is hallowed ground for somebody that wants to be a recording musician. And you not only did it for the five-year span that they say, hey, get such and such. It lasts for about five years. You've been doing it for 40 years. Uh, I feel very, very fortunate, yeah. very fortunate, and especially the time it was happening, you know, there was so much going on, you know, the late, you know, 80s and 90s, there's a lot going on, which is interesting because when I first came here, I mean, I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make records and as a kid. And, and um, when I first came here, it was kind of like in 1980, I came here with a band and, uh, um, you know, the recording industry seemed like it was it was hurting. And actually MTV kind of helped turn that around a little bit back then, you know, and and uh, actually a lot. And in my opinion, and and so I was like, oh, man, the thing I really wanted to do is fading, you know, but it didn't. It picked up, you know, and um, it was different than the period before me. And it's always been that way. Just like now it's it's different. It's not gone. It's just different than it was 20 years ago, you yep. know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's a different industry and studio musician is kind of a different thing, a little bit of a different thing now. And, uh, you know, as far as, you know, on longevity, I feel really fortunate with that. I, I think it's about, you know, willingness to, to move forward, you know, um, uh, I love new things. I love things changing. I, I miss some things in the past. There's some things that I, you know, I kind of mourn a little bit. And, uh, but, but I think change is good, you know, yeah. and, and, and we got to keep growing and, and shift and, and grow and, and not just to chase, but to really want to do it and to, to, to love whatever's, you know, coming up and, and I want to keep growing in that way. And it's a, you know, it's getting more and more as a land of diversity, right? I mean, we all, we all do a lot of different things now, yeah. you know, and, and uh, all related, but it's, you know, maybe, you know, 50, 60 years ago, you know, drummers could go to, they could just play drums and, and, and they had a drum kit and two snare drums and they made a million records, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and then in our time, you had multiple drum kits, 35 snare drums, electronics, and, you know, so, so many other things that we had to do and, and things shifted. And, you know, and nowadays it's, you know, it's gone on to a, a different thing. So, it, you know, things evolve and you just, you know, you know, you move, you move with it. 
you know. You, got, you, move, always been, <laughs> you move forward or you get left behind, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and I love it, you know. I mean, I, I spend as much time looking at, you know, studying new software and drum machines and electronic music as, uh, as much as I do as the music that I'm, I make a living at, you know. Yeah. And I learned from, from all of that. And producing, you know, and, and, and writing and, you know, um, <clears throat> You know, uh, I, I, it all helps, and it all helps our playing as well. You know, I, I welcome it. I, I think, I, I think it's a great thing. But well, yeah, is, I feel very yeah. for, fortunate with that. That is an amazing but, a, there's attitude. An, <laughs> there's another. There's another thing we have in common, though, is is the way you attack the drums. I, I really relate. Uh, I I love watching you play, and well, and, thank you. and uh, I can hear that, and um, just that the emotion that you that you play with a. a it's great, and your well, groove that, is, ah, is uh, outstanding. Well, that re I really, really appreciate that. That means a, a lot to me, and yeah. it, and it's like it's it's like likewise. I mean, your touch on the drums, you can go from the softest of the soft to the loudest of the loud, and knowing when to do that, and you've done it time and time and time again. That you're talking about the things you mourn. Um, I I kind of almost feel like when I moved to Nashville 25 years ago started to try to develop my touring and session career. I was like, I don't know if I, I want, I, I want to do both these. Like my model was like Kenny Aronoff. It's like jump on a plane, do the gig, come home, maybe catch a red eye to do somebody's record. So um, with Nashville being in the center of the uh, country, it was so easy to like, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you could do sessions. Then you go to the Kroger, get on the bus. You take the music to the people Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it was really, really good. And I feel like for almost eight years, we were just bouncing around multiple drum sets and all. And then things just kind of change like well look at all these samples we don't even need a decent house kid we'll just you know just come just give us the transients and <laughs> you know, that, right right you know, so it, it really it really has changed and that 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 ability to 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 change you know we don't want to make wine we can't make wine out of rotting grapes you got to grow evolve and change and you can't be rotting on the vine so i think that's incredible i mean just looking back at some of the um, and you probably experienced the same thing. Some of the technology in our lifetime. I remember getting an Alesis SR16 drum machine and learning it inside and out. And then it was like a, a Yamaha QS something sampler where we had to load the floppies in and keep the dancers on the floor. And oh, the drum cat came out. And then the SPDSX, which I think is probably one of the greatest inventions in the last 10 years of in the percussion industry. Mm -hmm. And we got to mm -hmm. keep learning all this stuff. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we don't we never stop learning, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it is. Um, like I said, I've studied more of that stuff now than ever. Um, constantly evolving the setup because I like to write and, and produce and, and stuff. So I'm always, you know, trying to look for new things. But uh, and or even studying things that you may not even use, but it helps you do what you do. You know, you get ideas from from a, a, a different technology or from how somebody else does something, you know, how sure. a synthesis programs something. And it kind of makes you gives you an idea. Um, yeah, I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff. Well, well I'm older than, than you are. So my 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 introduction to electronics was the Sinair, the the you know, the black the black little circle that that gave you that clap sound and that boo that syndrome sound love it and uh you know the disco days and um that and and then when i when i came here you know to la it was a transition and uh like even click track was pretty getting was kind of new there was click track prior but not a, not as much so um and with the invention of the drum machine, of course, the Lindrum came, and that was kind of like a start. And and you know, I remember, I remember really uh, w one of my one of the people that I that I really admired and and kind of wanted to, to made me realize I want to make records with Jeff Carl, You know, seeing his name on the back of records, him and Harvey Mason, and and other people were looking to credits and saying wow you know you could you can you would play with a lot of different people and play a lot of different songs you know and being in a band which is great it was like yeah but it's like that's like 10 songs a year you know you're learning and here you can you know you can do this every day and um and create create what it is you know and and so i remember uh when i came to town and and i knew jeff was you know he was using lindrum he was you know 
he he was he was open to, to all of that as well and that, that was impressive to me um but yeah within the simmons drums was out then right and uh so i remember going to guitar center i had i you know i was just starting out in 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 here and uh uh, I left the band. I'm like, I, I, I gotta pursue this. And, and, uh, uh, Simmons drums came out and of course I had no money and, and, um, you know, and things, things were a lot more expensive than yeah. to purchase than they are now, you know? And, um, as far as pieces of gear. And so I remember going to guitar center and Dave Waterman and Richie were so nice. They were drummers in the drum department then. And, uh, they were so nice to just let me come. And I, I lived right, right down the street from there. And I'd go and I'd, I'd learn how to program, you know, at least I knew that, you know, and there's rental companies here. You can rent it. And, and then when I could, I bought them and then I ended up with a rack starting, you know, doing a lot of sessions. I had a like five foot tall rack of <laughs> Simmons five, Simmons sevens, a mixer, a patch bay had uh, um, an MX one is a thing that, that you can, uh, it's kind of like a gate for your triggers, you know, yeah. on, on, on your toms. And, and we experimented with all kinds of things, you know, and, um, and how, to, you know, I had pads and a kit and the kit set up. Um, but it, it, it was interesting. You had the habit, but I, I used it maybe, you know, maybe a quarter of the time on most sessions, you know, and, uh, I, I had a four at, uh, me and a few of the guys, uh, uh, JR had one and, and a few other guys. Um, it was the first 96K 16 bit sampler and literally a floppy with one sound on each. And it was eight channels. I think the thing was at the time, it was like early, mid 80s. And it was like eight, eight grand or something back then, and, which was a lot of money then. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but you, how to have it. I used that the most and we used to trigger off of tape and that was the best thing. I just take it out of the rack to go in the room and, and we'd trigger off tape if we needed to. Um, but, I, but I, I love all that stuff. And, and in that, in that period of time that was happening, but interesting when I ended up doing the Tracy Chapman record, we went completely organic. And uh, in fact, we had, there was a thing, I don't know if it was the Russian dragon. It was something, it was, where the the where now it's easy to do uh but back then to be able to have your your sequencer follow your time the drummer's time right wow. and you know and we we had that we were going to try that and we aborted that pretty quickly it just wasn't tight enough and and in that record we we wanted it to be fluid because and there was not a click track on most of that and um uh so so we aborted that and that, that record was so organic. And then of course my career kind of went a lot of that. So it was a mixture of the real organic and then electronics. But in order to get in, in the, those early days, uh, early eighties, and there was a lot of drum machine kind of going on and, um, and a lot of drummers didn't want to have anything to do with it or the electronic drums. Ouch. And, I, I liked it, you know, yeah. and so they kind of they kind of faded away. It was kind of, I guess, a you know, good thing for me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but um, which you know, you got to remember now, like you know, you know, don't don't like negate what's what's the what's new because you'll kind of go away, you know, yeah. and uh, and uh, but um, you know, so I I I learned every machine I could. Yeah. And if I had, and I started doing that and then I, you know, do overdubs, you know, hi hats weren't great. So I do hi hats overdubs. It helped my time so much. Oh, sure. Being, having to play with the drum machine at that, at that time, because we didn't really do that. Now it's so easy. I mean, young players now, their time is or it's impeccable, right? Because they yeah. grew up with that. They grew up listening to that, grew up playing that. Yeah. And, uh, so, and then it just, and it graduated and I started, you know, just doing records and playing and, and, uh, and, and, and doing both, but yeah, it's really about music, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and well, w w production and, and styles of music. And, uh, you talk about going, uh, to other places with, uh, with other drums. Another thing that's changed is we used to, we used to 
go a lot. I used to go other parts of the country. I'd go to London a few times a year, New York and North Carolina, and uh, uh, to to do sessions. And uh, and a lot of times, you know, you're just playing what what's there. And uh, and it was and and you know, I I think the important thing is it, what what that taught me is I was taught early on is like don't don't blame your tools. Uh, you want you want great gear. You want you want to have that, uh, but you should be able to create with whatever's in front of you. Yeah, and if, don't if, be if, precious. You know, I, 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 that, exactly. that's kind of, that's kind of what I learned out. You know, from being a part time educator is that these these young whippersnappers, man, they do have fantastic time because they learned how to play drums in this Pro Tools era where everything is slammed to the grid, and they could you know they'll listen to like honky tonk women or some old Motown song. They're like, "Is the drummer?" I'm like, "Yes," but that's yeah. that's what happened, and now everything is yeah. just scrubbed to death. Um, but as a result, I'm feeling like everyone's inner clock is so just rock solid at such a young age. It's really, it's really a crazy thing. And then, and then us guys, we got to like keep up with the Joneses and be like, okay, this is the expectation. Um, but, uh, just back on the, uh, the gear thing, are you one of those guys that keeps a, uh, dead gear graveyard, like a, uh, like a, a museum of dead gear or did you get rid of everything? Um, I've been in the process over the last eight years or so eliminating yeah, and eliminating and then you get more and then you eliminate and then you get more. I'm in the process now. I want to eliminate again. Yeah. Cause the, the, you know, things change. I mean, when we went to sessions before, you know, every instrument had, you know, a, a huge truck arriving with a lift gate and two guys, you know, Carter's guys bringing in their stuff and it would guitar keyboards, drums, and some bass players and um uh you know we would have i would have at least three or four different probably four different kick drums brought a few different sets of toms with different heads a good 60 cymbals oh yeah uh, good 35 snare drums you know and i mean it was just crazy and even for you know a, a one song and uh you know, and, but, but, you know, back then you had the time to even try them, you know, these now, now, now with technology, you know, you can, like you say, we can change those sounds easily. Um, and there's more, there's also more, uh, more things we can do audio wise that, that we couldn't do back then. You just had a compressor delay and a harmonizer and a reverb, you know, and, uh, it's an EQ. There's a lot that you can do now. Um, and, and there's no time, you know, the, the time when we go into a, you know, when you, you, when you go into, a, especially, you know, if you're at home, that's one thing. But when you're going into the studio, you know, uh, things are done pretty quickly. And, yeah. and the, you know, it's like, oh, no, we won't try that snare drum. We'll, we, we'll take care of it later. We'll trigger it, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, you just have to, uh, you don't need it. You, you know, you don't, it's, it's just a different time. Um in place kind of like you know it's different too i mean we talk about time the the problem with the pro tools thing is is yeah people are used to having good time because of what they've listened to but they're not forced to because it's just they'll grit it after the case the case yeah. you know we used to you know practice have to practice to and and you know I, to a click i used to put a, a click track when i was starting a click track on one side of a cassette that, that and and a microphone for me and i would watch the bu meters and make sure that the the, the volumes were right uh like with my kick drum that i watched the bu meter to see the soft and loud i'd, I'd watch and make sure i was nailing that click and and you had to. There was no way of changing it or, 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 or fixing it. And I'm not saying it's better, but but it, it gives you this this center point it, where you when you know where that that kind of that perfect part is, then you you got you, you're you're grounded, and then you can play with that, and you can which you know is what we've grown up with. You know, is playing with that time, being able to nail it. 100 percent but being able to to purposefully move around it 
you know um you know i always say there's good out of time and bad out of time and 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 the good out of time is intentional you know and and you know even uh like you hear guitar players go yeah i'm 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 loose like keith richards well keith richards yeah has has this feel but it's 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 purposeful it, everything that that that's flowing there it's not just because they want it to be loose it's purposeful you yeah. know they, they know what they're doing and there's a reason for it there's a reason for it musically song wise you know melody yeah. wise you know groove wise and you know straight time it depends on your who you're working with who the singer is yeah you know for me for me i i, I don't you know the one thing i don't do is is play on a track unless the singer's on the track or there um because it's i don't know what to play uh, you know even if you, there's a part you're, you're supposed to play there's a million different feels within that tempo that you can put whatever limb in you know depending on on the phrasing of what's going to be comfortable for that singer you know yeah, that, yeah. and you know so that you know there's a lot of interplay there i, I think i think that that knowing that 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 perfection and that pulse especially that you know so mo- most people know nowadays um but then also being able to purposefully make that flow yes and make that musical you know yeah, yeah. Man, that that's incredible, and 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 it's obvious that you've had the career you've had because you have the sensitivity to storytelling and to vocals and to melodies. And you know, I tell people all the time, you know, we have this ability now to to create our own mix in the studio. And you'll see some of these session players mixes, and the click and the loop are just screaming. The drums are screaming, vocals down. All some of the instruments are down. Of course, if there's a guitar player that's pulling two, but let's let's pull him down. But if you're not relating to the storytelling, the melody all the blood and sweat and tears that this person did to write this song i mean that's really your job and it's going to inform all the choices you make whether it's bright toms dull toms are we putting the, the tea towels is it a flubby snare bright symbols dark symbols and it's it's quite obvious that that's you know how you that's a, a focus because your career has been with mostly vocalists and you know mine as well and that's it mm-hmm. doesn't another thing also that i noticed about your playing is that attention to detail with being able to sprinkle in and color percussion, whether it's just straight, you know, studio percussion, let's do a shaker bed and a tambourine bed. But every time I see you post a picture or something, it's like, Oh, he's got out the trash can snare or he's over gaffing timbales or he's got a Taos drum with a bass drum. I'm stealing all this stuff, Mm -hmm. man, you know, and if I have the ability to use that stuff, I do it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, we, you know, I, I have to say, I'm. I, it's one thing I'm really happy about what, what's going on right now because I see a, a, a lot of new drummers doing those things. You know, and and that wasn't happening for a while, and and we get to see that now, right? Like yeah. to see people's pictures, and you know, we did all that in records back then. Like I said, we had time. I mean, we would take a full day just to get a drum sound before you even start the record. You know, so we had time for that stuff and then and we'd switch between songs and um it was about it was the same thing that's going on now it's just that we you know you didn't know about it you know (laughs) because you know we didn't film sessions there were no photographs of that we just heard the records and um so you know i would use the side of a of my amble case as a kick drum you know with my you know just kicking it literally and and uh you know, we we would do all kinds of things, and and it was really kind of our way of also, you know, and one of the reasons why we had so many snare drums and why we did these things is kind of, you know, the technology and the drum machine thing. W- one thing that that brought, number one, it brought consistency in in the sound, but it but it brought um, this variety. You know, they had all of a sudden there's all these choices. So in order for for us to to also compete with drum machines, which we were competing with that was, um, uh, was, was to be able to, I remember, I remember, uh, oh man, this Bill Bruford, uh, yeah. cause he was what really into electronic drums and the yeah. thing and, and all that, you know, and he, and his thing was, he said, he goes, he goes, the only way to, 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 uh, you know, to, to compete, with drum machines and, and, and these things is to do what it can't do. 
and you know and 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 it made so much sense to me it like do what it do what it does but do what it can't do and and that is feel and emotion and dynamics and in that way and and uh now it's different now it, it can do a lot of those things but but in a different way and uh so yeah i i love that stuff well you know i do the same thing on tours i you know uh, though I, I always wanted to be that guy. I always wanted to be like, like I admire Steve Gadd so much where he's had the same kit his whole life, and, you know, not the same actual drums, but yeah. you know, and I had the uh, great opportunity of playing them once on this Pavarotti concert. I was like, I can't believe I'm playing Steve drums. And, uh, and, um, but I always admired that. I can't do it. I, I, uh, you know, I'm always trying to shift. I always have to shift. And I think for me, you know, we're all wired differently, you know, and I think for me, it just even makes me play differently. Like every tour, even every tour I do even with the same artists the next year, I have a different something different, you know, in my setup or set up a different way or I take things away or I add something in, a, in an odd way that makes me it's not comfortable. Nice. You know, necessarily, you know, yeah. and, and I. It makes you play differently. You're not playing that same fill, you know, and where everybody gets used to. And so we're not, there's nothing really going on because everyone kind of knows it's going to happen. Yeah. And you just switch it up, you know. And I think that's, 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 that's really important. Like when you set up those different things, you just, you just feel different. You know, yeah. so you're going to play a little differently. Yeah, you know? I, I've seen some of the photos where you know you've got your you've got an Akai sampler maybe for one tour, and then there's like maybe a, a an alternative side snare, and there's always some sort of like mounted uh, djembe, and then you've got all your different striking implements. You know, I love incorporating that stuff if I can. You know, a lot of stuff that we do on tours, you know, wham bam, thank you, man. This is just a rock and roll arena rock drum set, basically the Ringo <laughs> kit as a basis of everything. Then live, Mom, I got too. got the second floor Tom for the the blue and then the only thing right. that I change pretty much year after year is I, w I will change a ride symbol to be inspired to get a different kind of like wall of sound wash and then am I going to use the X hat or not you know what I mean because sometimes uh, I'm just, I'm uh, just cool. tired of the X hat over here um, uh. but yeah pretty much it's that same thing um, all the time but I selfishly I have a question about incorporating the um, the hand percussion in the studio do you, um, as a general rule, try to tune those to resonant notes in the key of the song, or do you like that rub a little bit? Um, not necessarily in the key, necessarily the key of the song, uh, but what feels right in it. Like if, if there is something that that uh, is an obvious rub, but it's not a good rub, then I'm going to tune it differently. Yeah, um, something that works within itself. It's melodic within itself and, and hopefully in the, in the track as well. And if I need to adjust it all up or down a little bit, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing a, a lot. The pandemic, I mean, um, one thing I, I, I did is, is I, I just ordered all this percussion and, and, and a lot of in this, the, the trash can toms, stuff like that. And I, I wanted to create something. Uh, I really love analog sounding um drums you know an analog machine drums and uh like electron stuff and 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 i wanted to get that warmth and that 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 tone that it has and and be able to do that percolating thing that that we can do with machines but do it ourselves and and um with that feel and touch and because i always feel like there's something about a human touch that that, that's nice in, in there as well and um so I, I i created this setup and uh where uh i can just play it all with my hands and they all have you know all the pitches were kind of uh positioned and uh, there's a combination of different things in there and i've, I've used it a lot I, i've tried it in the studio and and, and I, i've used it a lot over the last two years and and i'll you know, I'll take away or move things around a little bit. But there's a certain melodic thing I want to do uh, and, you know, change the pitching, but not necessarily with the key. Although these days, if, if I am uh, using a sample, a lot of times I'll try to get the kick drum in, in the key. 
And because uh, a lot of times you'll have an 808 bass with that or something. Yeah. And when that's in key, it, it doesn't clash as much and easier to mix in. Yeah, the reason uh, I ask is because when you, you know, if you, if you mic a djembe, a Remo djembe or an LP djembe on the top and the bottom, you know, that bottom, uh, you know, note's got to yeah. be somewhere near the a tonal center, seems like. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot, you know, uh, you know, you're uh, you're also dialing out a lot of that low end too, the high pass, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, it, and you know when it comes to mixing, we like all that low end, but then when it comes down, if you have a kick drum, like I, I basically double, and I think what, what makes a difference too is when I'm doing the djembe, um, it's almost all within a kit, right? And 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 the center, the low note is always with the kick drum. So everything I'm doing with the low note is 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 the kick drum supporting it. Ah. So you're you're getting that you know, both of those tones too. But it is it's a challenge. It's a challenge when you, when you do mix in that 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 low note. And some djembe's are easier to tune than others. You know, and then live, you know, unless you have a synthetic head, it's a nightmare. You know, yeah. between the you know hundred degree humidity during the day and then at night, you know, it gets cold and. And you know, when you're ready to play and everything's changed, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, I have like this little wish list. I got to reach out to Chris Hart and be like, hey, man, I I never all these years have had a Remo Mondo snare. And do you have oh. any spokes laying around? Because I remember back oh, in the yeah. day I had the spokes and I don't know what the hell happened to them, but they would be so cool to uh, to kind of get back in my setup. Oh, man, I, exactly the same thing I've been thinking about lately. I used to set them up. I, in fact, I used to set them up all around and overdub was up the where we'd have the assistant engineer spinning them, and, and as you would play, cause that's make cool, beautiful sounds. Yeah, and uh, and then we'd use them hi hats, and uh, I love those, and and uh, I've been seeing them a little bit lately too, and I've thought about, it, I go, what the hell happened to those? You I know, know? that, but the Remo, uh, you know the, the spokes hi hats, that was a really cool yes. thing. Yes, oh, so beautiful. Um, yeah. God, Terry going, Bozio, I think, first started doing that. Yeah, right? yeah. Now I was kind of inspired when I watched him play. This was way back in the day, going going way back. But I wrote a piece in college called Automation, and it was like I wanted it to sound like super. It was like a legit piece, so like a percussionist that didn't have any drum set training could play it. Um, but it was there was a lot of spokes, you know. And I, I that was the oh, last my. time I used them, man. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. but um. So you've been so involved with so many like seminal groundbreaking records. So you mentioned the the Tracy Chapman record. Now that was the um, that was the record with Fast Car, right? Yeah, it was the first record. Yeah. So uh, I I was listening to that yesterday, kind of boning up for this. And um, so was are you saying that was no click track back in the no, day? Then no click track. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I was back. About, um, I always tell this to people because you, when you mentioned this earlier and you reminded me of this, uh, something earlier, um, that, uh, yeah, like put on, um, uh, uh, talk about a revolution, you know, then go to the end and then go back to the beginning. You're like, oh, you know, it, it's quite a difference, but it, it had to, you know, it, it was part of it. If we like, let's take that track. If, if, if we kept it too, too straight, it just didn't didn't do what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And, and, you know, most of those takes were about, you know, there's all kinds of different production styles. Right. And, and, um, uh, most of these takes in, in that record was, uh, it was really about the vocal. I and mean, I learned so much on that record because it was really about the vocal and, and her, her presentation when it's right, then, you know, it's right. Even if she was going to redo it, you know, kind of like I was talking about earlier, playing with the singer, even if they're going to redo it, if they sang, the, if you play to them, then they can, they're free, right? And and that's kind of how this was. A lot of it was, you know, we, they kept the like vocal takes and guitar takes, but some stuff that they had, if they did, she chose to redo things or change lyrics or something, you know, it was, it was easy for her to do. Yeah. Feel-wise. Uh, and you know, and those songs just needed to breathe. And it's really about the lyrics and, 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 and the tones. And, um, you know, I very much always want to know what the lyrics are, what the meaning of the song is. And, sure. you know, it helps you. I remember hearing Hal Blaine say, you know, if, if, 
if the bridge has dark lyrics or dark chords, you know, I, I go to Tom's, I stay off the cymbals. I don't stay bright. I, you know, things like that to think about. And, um, you know, and that's how we approached a, lo a lot of that record. That record was kind of in order to make it that work, that movement work, the, the groove has to be really wide, you know, it can't be all, too tight and pinpointed or else then it's real obvious if 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 it's just massaging you know it, it feels good so a lot of that tracking was was um tracy and i was i'm i'm usually on the back side of the beat anyway um a lot and and um i i grew up my my real foundation is funk and soul uh as a kid and <clears throat> and i just kind of that snare drum hidden in the backside kind of thing. And, and, and I, um, you know, I still incorporate that today, but I, I'm, you know, I was way on the backside and, and, and then, and there's Tracy and then Larry was kind of in between. And so we, we had this kind of this massaging thing going on, you know? And so you don't, you don't feel it, you don't, you don't feel it moving, but it had to, but if I played too straight, it was there was no excitement there was like yeah. no one like was going that's a great take you know it, it had a had a move well it was gorgeous it's a gorgeous record and and, and it it harkens back to that uh, that golden era to me the laurel canyon area uh, era with you know let's uh we have this beautifully written song that's going to change lives let's let's kick it off and just see what happens and it goes where it goes you know well, it was really interesting. I mean, she really set the stage for for a whole new era right there, right? And of singer-songwriters that came out. And um, she, uh, you know, and I have to say, I have to give her and David Kirshenbaum this credit. And that was a time period. Music in that, in that time period, everything that was on the radio was kind of like today, you know? And it was like a lot of drum machine, or if you were playing on it, it had, at that time, I had to be like i had nails bury the click every 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 hit right yeah. and it couldn't even phase and um and so that was an interesting project because that was the era was it was coming out i was i was just really starting to do records and and on on a, on a better higher level and and um uh i got called to audition for that you never really auditioned for records and mm -hmm. And um, I had a tour I was supposed to do, and I wanted to make records. And 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 I they sent me her cassette, and I'm listening to it, and thought, oh, man, this is incredible. And um, so I I graciously got someone else to do the tour, and and you know I I mean I say graciously because I had a a good rapport with the artist, and and it was fine, and and uh, just to do the audition, and uh, and. I had no idea I was going to get it or not, but it was just worth it for me just to do this audition. And um, uh, some people might think that was crazy, but but um, but it, it was in line with what your, what your goals were. You were like, look, yeah. I I can tour, but I'm turning down tours because I want to stay in this beautiful city and make these records. And to do that, I've got to be home. Which I thought was yeah. you know, which was really brave. And you know, reading your bio, I mean you must have been a very confident, brave young man to move to Los Angeles at 19 years old. I mean, I remember when I was 19, I couldn't, I, I don't even think I was, I had done my laundry yet. I was a spoiled, mm -hmm. the firstborn Italian prince. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, I moved to Los Angeles at 19. And then I started looking at some of the records. So you probably, well, so you're, Ita you're Italian as well. I'm Italian Irish. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Italian German. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, crazy yeah. man that's a good that's good good food at the table there um yeah. yeah you know i was just that that i think you were making high level records at 28 years old or something like that i mean i don't remember playing that well at 28 and you're making career defining records at 28 it's pretty incredible no oh, thank you thank you well on that on that particular record you know making that decision i went down to play and I heard other rhythm sections going in and, and um, I can hear it kind of through the wall and, and, and there were guys, quite frankly, I was like, oh shit, you know, they were, they were ahead of me, you know, career wise and, and, um, uh, you know, had more experience and, uh, 
but they were playing. I heard them playing. They were playing like it would be on the radio. And, um, and I, I didn't know this at the time, but <clears throat> Tracy had started the record, I think with, 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 with another producer and some really great musicians. And, um, it just, that was going in, a, it just didn't have what she was looking for. And she, she sought it, she sought out, uh, David Kirschenbaum. And, and so to David's, you know, credit, he said, well, let's put together the right situation for you. And that's why he held the auditions. And, and it was done great because it was in the recording studio. So, you know, doing this kind of auditions in a rehearsal studio wouldn't make sense to me. And, and the recording studio made sense to sound like a record or not. Right. Yeah. And, and so, um, and I heard her a little bit through the, through the, through, through the, the walls and was amazed at her consistency. And uh, so anyway, I went and played and I was, I was thinking, this is how I hear it. They're either going to hate it or, or like it. And I had no idea. And I just did my thing, which was, you know, I probably had one hand a brush and another hand something else and did somewhat reggae-ish feel with something or, you know, and, and it wasn't a pop thing at all at the time, you know, but I, I just didn't hear that with her. And uh, so I did it and went home. And back then it was, drum, it was that answering machine, drum machines, answering machines. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so I, I, you know, it was a message there. It's like, Hey, can you come back tomorrow? And uh, we, we want you to do this and we're going to keep looking for bass players. So I went back and, and we, we auditioned it was a bunch of bass players that came in and I didn't, uh, know Larry Klein, but uh, yeah, I knew it was playing really well. And so I, I said, what about Larry Klein? And, and so David, they sent, they delivered him a cassette. He said, yeah, I'll come tomorrow. And he came and, and we started the record that day. Awesome. It was, it was great. And, uh, and ironically, uh, Larry was writing with the artist. So the band was supposed to go on tour. Was, the name was Cock Robin. It was, uh, uh, we just finished this record and, and, uh, which was so different than Tracy's record because it was a, one of the first all digital records. It was all done in the Synclavier. I played live into the Synclavier and we, we triggered, we, we, I tested every trigger I could find as far as the speed. Uh, it was triggering it and we did all this it was a great learning experience and you it was still a had to like record. glue them on the heads at that time the piezo triggers right actually i, I glued them on pads because we did the pads but ah. we, cause it, it wasn't a combo and then i did overdubs to it but um yeah we, we I literally just wanting the trigger to be the, the most dynamic and the quickest and yeah. so it was because we didn't quantize everything it was a live feel and and so we wanted it as close as possible and uh but anyway, we're there, and that was the tour supposed to do. And, and he uh, he comes up, he goes, "Hey, I was just talking about you last week uh, with Peter. You know, we're writing, and, and that was the the songwriter for the band we were in the tour. So it was this strange, interesting, you know, circle that, that that happened. And then you know, we became really good friends, and so we played a, we played a lot together since then. Um, but yeah, but that but that was the you know the essence of that record, and we we started it and and, and finished that, and then the second record we did this was the same configuration, and um, you know that was interesting because she, you know, we did that record. The label wanted it quick because uh, the record was so successful, and they wanted to put out another record, and and uh, so it was like within ten months, and she had been touring, so you know, and she had written some, but a lot of it was songs from before. But I didn't know, you know, we didn't know it would be that successful. Um, I didn't, you know, but again, because it was so different than, than things that were really happening at, at that point. It was, it was a great learning experience for me on this level, too, um, because I was on tour. I was on tour with uh, Linda Carlisle and the Heaven on Earth tour, and, and um, uh, I didn't want to go. And, and, and the manager and the producer uh they're going, no, I just come down, just play, just help us audition people. And okay, well, all of a sudden I'm there and doing it. And uh, um, I had it, you know, I, I, I didn't want to do it only because I was really starting to do a lot of records. And, and uh, but it ended up being a great experience. I, I love it. And I'm so happy I, I, I did it. But we were out on, on tour and, and Donna Delory, one of the background singers, comes on the bus. We're in Europe. 
and she throws down the CD and says, I love this. And, and I look at it and, and it was a Tracy Chapman record. I thought, Oh, I didn't even know it was out. And I guess what had happened is she, she was playing uh, some big concert in, in the UK and it was televised around the world. And she went on early and then at the end at prime time, Stevie wonder supposed to go out and, Stevie's Synclavier went out ah. or whatever he was using. And, and so they said, get the girl with guitar up here, you know, and, and, and uh, so while we fix this. And so it was prime time. She went out and did her thing. And I think that week it sold like 3 million records or something is, you know, it was, uh, wow. so the cool, the cool thing about it is the people chose it. Right. And so the people, you know, she, she did that. The audience chose to love her and want to buy the record. And so then radio and everything else, you know, picked up on it, became what it was. So it was a very, uh, you know, she got, she got her, her claim, you know, honestly, you know. And so, so you played people, on that record, set her on her path, and then you go out and you're doing the Belinda Carlisle tour. Who went out and played live with Tracy? Well, the record wasn't out yet when I was doing ah, it. It gotcha. just came out, right? Gotcha. Tracy was doing Tracy was solo, and she was doing all her solo stuff. Um, I never played live with her again because I then at that point I did stay home. I I, I start I I toured a little bit with Starship and too, and it did a few other things. But uh, when my, my fir our first child was going to be born, I I uh, I, uh, I said, you know, I I, I don't want to miss it, and so I I. I called everybody I was working with touring wise said, you know, I, I think you know, I, I got to stay home and they were all great gracious about it and said, you can always come back. Just let us know. And, um, I didn't, uh, and I really wanted to be home. So, uh, and then ironically, everything, that's when the Tracy thing was hitting and everything. And, and, and my career changed. I was making records and, yeah. um, and, uh, um, I was, it was wonderful. And, um, so I stayed home and then what happened about five years later, you know, I was getting back a lot of these records. I remember, uh, you know, I, 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 w I don't listen to what I, I only listen like once and I critique what I did and that's it. Unless I hear it out somewhere. And, um, and, uh, I remember listening to on the way to a session it was a T-bone Burnett session. And, uh, and T-Bone would do multiple sessions sometimes. And, and so I got there and, and Jim Keltner was there doing another session for him. And he goes, Hey, how you doing? I was like, shit. And he said, why? He said, I said, well, I said, I got, you know, I got a few CDs right now. That I just uh, played on, I said, I played the same crap on everything. And, and, uh, and so it felt like, and he starts laughing. I said, it's not funny. He goes, no, he goes, I've been there. He goes, it is funny. He goes, he goes, when do you, how long have you, since you've uh, played live? I said, like five years, you know, touring he goes, okay. He says, you know, he goes, listen, he goes, here's the point. He goes, you know, you know, the producers that you work with, you know, you know, aren't going to stop using you if you're not around. Um, and they probably get excited if you haven't, you know, some new blood in you next thing that comes up just take it just go on tour and just have another life experience just get out there do it and then come back and it'll be fresh and I, I kid you not literally the next day i got a phone call to to go uh play with heart and it was um it was uh a, acoustic and electric so i can you know and help with arrangements and do all the stuff and and it was like right up my alley, incredible vocals. And, you know, oh, yeah. and uh, so I was like, all right, Jim said I got to take this. And, and uh, so I, I went and did it. And then I was touring a lot, you know, from, from, from different things. But, it, but he was right. It, it didn't hurt my, my you know, my, my record making. But I, I, and I think it kind of helped because you say about longevity, there was a time period there in the, in the mid nineties where I'd done so many records, you know, I think it very well could have gone, uh, no, can we just, can we hear somebody else, you know? And, um, as far as producers and, and, and artists, um, where I think it organically 
going off and doing these these tours and there were kind of there were tours that people knew about and um and then i would come back in and and, and do records in between but I, I think the fact that it wasn't so saturated for a period of time kind of it's kind of like kind of like it disappeared for a second it's like oh yeah where's danny it wasn't like we're sick of him like you know yet <laughs> you know and i think maybe if i wouldn't have gone on tour maybe that would have happened you know uh-huh. um but, but and also it didn't make me you know all those things make make you come home there was a thing i did i did for a couple of years in japan um which was another tour where i i you know i actually said no it was after after the heart thing well then that was meeting john paul jones a lot of things led from that and, and then after the heart thing i got called to do this japanese tour and I said no a couple times. I was fo- focusing on producing and stuff, and and uh, and it was the one time where I took the gig. I say for the wrong reason. It was because because the offer became really great, and I was like, I guess I got to go. And um, but and I I say that for the wrong reason because I've never done things for the money. I, I feel like if you do if you do what you're supposed to do, that will come. And um, you know, I would take things if something was a lot of money, but something was to me far more musical or 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 something I wanted to do that wasn't. I would take that one. Yeah. Uh, I've always gone that that direction. So it's the first time I did it for that reason, and but it ended up being such a great thing. So I had such a great experience, incredible people. Ended up going back for like three years. I could have continued it. But I didn't want I, I didn't want to lose what I had here, but I had such a great musical experience because we were I was the only uh, 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 Western musician, and so our, our groove was different, and I learned so much about our language and our groove and and you know our feel and um, and and then we 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 came across this. I was way on the back side. They were always way on the top side. And by the, like the second tour, we made this groove that that I haven't experienced with anyone else. Wow. You know, and yeah. it was a great, great learning experience. And so that made me come back and play differently. And so I was playing a record. And I was playing with a different edge, you know. Oh than, yeah. Than than I was. So they Man. taught me a lot. Yeah. You know. So I, I think I, that uh, all those things kind of kind of help and then producing in the meantime too it helped me understand records more understand song understand melody and you know so so you know uh, you know hopefully you get better at, at playing to that you know yes so. and, and another another heavy record was of course the counting crows august and everything which does not age it is like a snapshot in time but it also sounds like it was recorded yesterday i mean the songs are so Mm. great and um of course the drummer in the band at the time was a friend of both of ours steve bowman yeah and um i I think you know this is one of those uh stories in the drum industry that everybody talks about like um denny's the guy that comes in if the drummer for whatever reason doesn't like the song or is it's not happening or he just can't get the feel it's not in that guy's wheelhouse like steve is an amazing drummer but there was just one particular song that was like well let's let's bring denny in and see what happens and Mm -hmm. i think steve steve told me he's fine with it and it is just it was a snapshot in time at that particular time you played on the single right yeah well see back then there was a lot of there was a lot of things that that went on a lot, yeah. and especially with drums because you couldn't fix drums. And back then, everything was done off of the drums, right? The drums are usually the first thing recorded. Um, I did a lot of those kinds of records. I did a lot that I'm not credited for, yeah. um, and um, it was just that that period of time. This one was, you know, but but what I would do is. I would ask the producer if the if the drummer was still in town, you know, those are falling out, they're still around. If they were still around, I would say, just let me come in and work with them and first and to so see if we can get them on tracks. And and if and if and at the very least, if I have to do some of it, um, they'll understand. 
you know, and I'll have them sit next to me and I want to make sure I'm not playing anything they don't like because they got to go play this for the next, hopefully, the rest Decades. of their life. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, and, and so, you know, that, that's what I would try to do. With, with, this, with this situation, I was already playing percussion on the record. I was doing overdubs. And, uh, and T-Bone, I think I was doing that already. Uh, T-Bone called and said, hey, there's this, there's this track. I think there was two tracks. I forget. No, I think maybe just that one. Uh, there's this track that uh, that um, I think there's going to be a single, and um, uh, and the thing is, is Steve. It wasn't that he. It wasn't an inability. No, it was. It was. It, it just wasn't. It wasn't his wheelhouse necessarily. Um, uh, and and you know, and the fact that it just wasn't something he was comfortable with or even really liked at the time, you know, right. what he wanted, he wanted to do. And, um, you know, his stuff is so beautiful on that record. And he's, sure is. you know, he, all the upbeat snare things he did, all the beautiful grooves he did. And, um, I loved playing percussion over it. And, um, he, uh, <clears throat> so he went down and Steve was so cool. And what was nice about Steve is he was championing it. He said, yeah, have him come down and do it. And, um, and he was kind of a, he, he mentioned some records that I played on that, that weren't successful records. And it was kind of like, Oh, you know, they're cool records that, you know, that he liked and um, some cool artists and uh, good songs. Yeah. And so I sat him next to me and, and I said, you know, we're, we're doing this together. You know, you tell me if you hate something. And, and um, we, uh, um, I think I did one one run through, <clears throat> and uh, just like getting sounds and one run through, and and I think he had mentioned, oh, the only thing is on, the, I think it was the the bridge, like going with the ride he had going on or something. So uh, we did that, and we did it in one take. T Bone and T Bone just mentioned to me a few months ago, and. Uh, did this thing and and i just had at you know adam i when i track even live for me it's if there is a click and it's the click in uh uh and vocals but it's it's really i have 80 percent vocals and hardly anything else and uh um so you know i i'm i'm singing i'm playing to that and and that's all the emotion because i really feel like we're the conductor. We're the modern day conductor. Sure. You know? And and so we have to we have to be support not only supporting that vocal live. A lot of times you have to support that vocal if they're if, you know if you, if you need to be you know sub, a little bit more subdued to support where they're at that night. You do you need to be push them a little bit more. You need to push. You do that. But you you know you you work with them. You're a team. Yeah. And and if if everyone else is listening to either one of you then it'll work, you know, and, and it's kind of which and I feel our job is. And so, uh, that's the same in the studio. So we did that. And, and, and Steve said to me, he goes, um, it doesn't look that hard, you know? And, and the thing is, is when it comes to those kind of grooves, those simple grooves, um, it, it's not something a lot of drummers are used to doing and unless they're in the studio and, and, and under that, under that microscope, you know, they may practice it and do it and they could sound good on it, but, but it's just not, it's not natural for them because they don't spend a lot of time in it because it's not fun, you know, that yeah. they want to do other things. That's like a lot of times the biggest thing missing in, in, in drummers coming in the studio. And this is back when, not so much today, but back when hi hat was was everything, right? And that's 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 the groove. And 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 hi hat was the last thing people, a lot of drummers and bands thought about because it didn't do anything. It didn't wasn't loud, you know. The kick and snare was the thing they liked. And 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 maybe we don't hear hi hat all the time, but it's such a big part of the feel. Yes. And for me, my hi hat never stops. And and or at least at that time and. <clears throat> So, uh, we, we kind of, you know, you know, we talked about it and I even said, you know, so, well, you know, we want to try it. And then he said, you know, no, I, you know, 
this is this is working and um he uh he was he was fine with it he was happy we became friends so he went out and we we went out and hung out quite a few times and and um one of the funniest guys in the world so, and yeah. he lived up in, in northern california which i was from yeah and um when i go visit my parents we'd get together and hang out and, that's killer and yeah, he's, been, he's been in nashville a good 10 years now uh, i remember when he moved to town we became yeah. fast friends he was wanting to chase session work here but he's a great i mean obviously a great songwriter drummer and he's doing some teaching and he's a great he's a great drummer i i, yeah. I, I love him and uh you know and he was great so it was not it was there was no, it wasn't at all the fact of of of, of an inability or or or, or that it was, it was just his a connection a connection yeah. and he was you know he's an artist he he's um you know i admire him for 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 going i like that song or i don't feel comfortable <laughs> with that right, right now you know right. or I, that's not a thing where you know and and you know i'm in a different position i'm i kind of in what i do i'm kind of not in it's harder for me to do that, you know, or else I, you know, and, you know, I got to kind of find, I have to find my, my connection and yes. pretty quickly. And, um, so, you know, I, I admire him for that. And, and he's a great drummer. I'm glad I didn't have to play any of the other songs. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just I mean, half the cop what he did. You know, just a fantastic you know, record. I mean, I, I I have friends that are just like, yeah, man, that's like my my Desert Island record, you know. And I've listened to it five thousand times. Um, so so that's interesting. And and I wanted to just ask you, you know, you uh, you kind of use the use the '70s as like a training ground. You 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 open your career to session drumming in the '80s, and I forget what the date was on the magazine, but it was that classic. Uh, modern drummer um, issue, and you're on the cover with Hiltner and Mike Baird and Jeff and Vinny, and and it was like Harvey. a Harvey, yeah, a Harvey, a LA session that had to be like a pinch me. What was it? Was that like eighty eight, eighty nine, or was it nineties? I think it was ninety, like yeah. ninety ninety one. Wow. Um, it was uh, it was crazy. Um, yeah, I I literally still feel like I pasted my picture on there, um, and <laughs> uh, it, it was it was pretty wild because literally when I was um, when I was a teenager, uh, uh, we hitchhike and go to Berkeley uh, Tower Records because they had three floors and and it was a used floor, and I went to the used floor because I'd noticed you can see who played on it, and and I started following people and i and especially for me jeff and harvey mason and jeff, uh, harvey on all r&b stuff and jeff uh singer songwriter stuff and, and rock stuff and and uh and i i learned so much of those two and to be in this room with them and all of them uh, since then and um but uh yeah it was it, it was quite an ama amazing experience i i uh I felt like the whole day I just kind of just listened and, you know, we'll go, yeah, what he said. And yeah, what he said, yeah, what he said, you know, and, uh, uh, um, it, it was, it was quite, quite amazing, quite, yeah. quite an amazing experience. Yeah. And, um, I still don't feel worthy of being there, but, but I was, I was, uh, very appreciative. Oh, man. that's for sure. Oh, no, man. That's <clears throat> That is is amazing. It's just like if you have a vision, you have a focus, you have a plan, you know, you can end up anywhere. I, I remember one night I was hanging out with, with Don Lombardi, and next thing I know, we're, I'm sitting at a restaurant with Thomas Lang, Tony Royster, and, and me and Keltner are splitting a cheesecake. And I was like, it was like, uh, it was, it was like we we're at prom or something, you know? <laughs> And I was uh, like, yeah, how yeah. the heck did this happen? But you know, if you uh, just if you just keep your you, you know stay in the game and you know keep growing and keep that laser focus and just keep moving that ball down the field, there's no telling where you can end up. You know? Yeah, you know, you you gotta be, you gotta you, you gotta really love it, you know, and yeah. really want it and devote yourself to it. And and I think it's important, you know, I. I it's it's obvious from 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 your playing and and I and as well and I think this is really important is for to to be yourself your your own self. When I first came and wanted to do records, I was told these two things. I was saying uh, it's kind of diminishing 
because the record industry was changing a little. It's diminishing, number one. Number two, um, there's only five guys on each instrument, and they're already there. Uh, and, and there's no room for anyone else. And number three, and if you have any consideration to it, you have to have, you can't use your drums. You got to get these drums and have these couple extra snare drums. And, and I thought about it. I thought, well, okay. Obviously there's not, if I get, if I sound like everyone else, then of course there's no room for me. And you know, I would get them. And, and I like my drums, you know, and, and I, and I had my own thing. And, and, and even though I learned from everybody and I, you know, and soak all that in, I think it's really important for us to then regurgitate that stuff in our own way. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and to, to, you know, to have, 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 we're the best, we're the best at being ourselves. You know, can someone say, hey, you know, Rich, you know, give me this Ringo feel. Could, can you do that? Yes. You know, I, I know for myself, I will literally channel myself and picture that person and, and try to be that. Right. Yeah. And but, you know, it comes off. It's reminiscent of that. You know, it's not exactly that. And and I and it's best to have some of yourself in there as well, because it's just going to come off more believable. You know, it's like there's that thing that people say it's obnoxious. I remember hearing about it before I started, and and it's actually kind of not obnoxious. It depends, it depends on how it's delivered, I guess. But that thing of like, yeah, can you play like so and so? And then the musician may say, well, why don't you get so and so? And 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 there is a point where where you say, well, that kind of makes sense, you know, if that's what you really want, you know. I remember uh, I've been asked a lot to do records of, of maybe kinds of music and styles that I grew up playing, but I haven't played in decades. And, yeah. and, and, um, and I'd actually go, well, why don't you get so-and-so to do this? You know, they're, they're actually great at this. And, and they'd say, no, we want your take on it. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Then yeah. I feel comfortable doing it. No, it's going to be my take on it. And, and, um, because if you're looking for this, then it's going to be a struggle, and uh, you know to get there. Uh, I remember doing a a, a, a movie called Thing. It's called a uh, thing called Love. It was one of the, one of the Last River Phoenix movies, and, and it was about Nashville. Yeah, Blackbird. it was about the Bluebird. Right. They filmed it at the Bluebird, Bluebird. Cafe. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, amazing yeah, Bluebird. And and uh, and I remember being a Capitol set up, and the rest of the band were you know really great musicians been far more in in uh, the countryside of things and 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 uh and um you know and i had th- that ability more on the americana side maybe sure and uh but not i didn't i didn't picture myself as being as authentic as these guys and i remember saying to the producer I said, what am i doing here you know <laughs> and it's like these guys are like and because we had basically all these artists, great artists coming into Nashville and singing. And we were just, we were set up there recording all this music. And, uh, and he, and he said, goes, no, he goes, I want your take. I want yeah. a little bit more of a rock take than, 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 than that. And a, a different thing. And, it, and that was free. It was like, okay, you know, I, I, you know, I can get myself into what they're doing and especially with the singers, you know, and then if I can, still be who i am then it's it's going to come off better you know it's going to come off more believable you know i i learned that early uh don gaiman great producer yeah really was the reason why I probably do what i do the day i worked with him it was on a brian setzer record in the la bamba soundtrack and then brian's record my life changed that's when i was starting to do a lot of records and uh lining up and then the tracy thing took it a step further um but um what was that brian set the record the the first one it was a uh, live new guitars live new guitars so i listened to it yesterday but, and i was just saying like i'm doing the math like i said you must have been like 28 years old you're you're I was about 25 then but that's even, it's even more yeah. it, like i don't yeah, remember cool. playing like that and and that's yeah. your understanding of train beats and shuffles and rockabilly and the 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 zeppelin thing all that stuff is in there and it's so well recorded oh, I mean, thank you yeah 
Amazing. Yeah, we, you know, well, what, 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 uh, what Don said to me then, he goes, you know, it's all about casting and casting people, you know, it's not only with personalities, it's, 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 you know, people who can get what you're looking for, but for it to feel real and feel authentic, you yeah. know, coming from that, that person, that, that means a lot. Now that record was, that was an interesting thing. This is a, a good thing I, I think to share. Uh, I like to share this a lot. Things have happened almost every kind of big thing that's happened or big leap has happened is, 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 is happened in a way that you would least expect it. Yeah. It wasn't in, in your direct plan, in your way of, of getting there. Um, I was, again, I really wanted to make records and it was a bass player, very good friend of mine who called me up and said, Hey, I'm doing this, this, these shows. He wasn't, syncing up with the drummer he goes would you do this you know would you do these shows this is our artist on mca and i i said no i was uh just doing some other sessions and and um and he asked again a couple weeks later and i said yeah and i went and did two shows and one show uh, the band was great I had fun <clears throat> you know once it was just at a, a rock club here in la and the sound guy was ross hogarth who's now great producer engineer and uh and he was doing a live sound for it and we did sound check and at the end of sound check he came up to me he said he goes hey i'm working uh with don game and he's doing this new brian setzer record they're looking for a drummer um you want to come and play i'm like yeah and so the next night i uh went to rehearsal studio or something and played played with brian for about 20 minutes or so. And then they went out and talked and came back and asked me to do the record. And if I wouldn't have taken that, if I wouldn't have said yes to that, that to playing that show, that would have never happened, yeah. you know, and, and doing that record, not only did I learn a hell of a lot, um, I, I, you know, the fact of working with Don too, you know, back then, producers there were producer managers that had like all the top producers and and you know he was part of that team and um you know so all the other producers looked at who he was using they all knew each other and so they started calling you know and um because don trusted me and and so you know they they started looking and so really that was a huge leap you know, that just that one, that one record. And it wouldn't have happened if I didn't go out and do this thing that I didn't want to do, you know, and, uh, or even going out, you know, there's, there's things that have happened. It's like, go see someone play or something. And, 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 you know, the last minute you decide, okay, I'm going to go do this and you go and, and, and I've never been like a huge social, like go out and do a lot of things. I'll go out sometimes and I've, and, you know, you literally come home and, you know, something will come out of it, you know, and if you wouldn't have done that, you know, it, it wouldn't happen. It wasn't that, you know, it, it isn't that there's no direct line, it, you know, yeah. the whole thing is putting energy out there, you know, and, and or just like you doing this or, or us doing this, this is just putting energy out there. Yes. Right. And so that comes back. In, in different ways, you know, I love that all, all story. kinds of things come out. You know? I, uh, I love that story because I feel like there are those types of stories for a lot of uh, I don't know if you've ever gotten a chance to meet Sandy Gennaro uh, that played with Cindy Lauper and Joan Jett and yeah, no, I have I haven't met him. No. Well, we're you know, he was a, he was, a, you know, uh, a hero of mine, like growing up, I'd be sitting there in my yeah. underwear in front of MTV eating cereal, watching him play. We're like, yeah. oh man, that's cool. That's what I want to do. He was saying the years uh, that he was doing a gig and he was running out the door after a show, trying to get to the limo or whatever. And some guy was talking to him and said, listen to this tape. And can I talk to you for a second? And if he hadn't stopped and talked to that guy, he wouldn't have been able to, to recommend him for the Cindy Lauper job, which changed his life and put his career on another um, if I hadn't taken a job with our guitar player that I've been playing with for 25 years, we were just doing riverboat shows and casinos, not glamorous. 
he wouldn't have been able to recommend me to the bass player that was putting the band together for Jason Aldean, a job I've had for 23 years. So, mm -hmm. so when people say all the time, you know, what's your advice for, um, for introverts, Rich? I say, <laughs> get out. You know what I mean? Just like, <laughs> like, like, just like yeah. get uncomfortable. Just put yourself out there. Go, go talk to people, go be part of the community. Yeah. 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 Well, even my, I, you know, I, I want to take that back about Sandy. I think I met him at the NAMM show one time, but what, what my very first tour, uh, I was thinking it was like 81 or 82. Yeah. Um, it was Andy Frazier uh, from free, the band free. We were open. It was, it was opening for the fix that big uh, reach the beach record that they oh, did. That's big, and I yeah. uh, love that record. Ooh. And, but how that came about was, I mean, I was just starting here and, and, I, uh, I got a phone call. I, I, I needed money. And so the union would, 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 uh, especially around Christmas, the trust fund that they, they would do like a, you get paid a little bit of money to go play like a prison or juvenile hall or convalescent home or something. Or right? the airport. And, yeah. Right. <laughs> and you know, you show up and you don't know anybody. You just play. And, and I had done a lot of that since I was like 15 in, in the Bay area, I was playing gigs and, and, you know, I, I was so fortunate to play with such great musicians up there, but there were all those kinds of gigs. And that's not what I wanted to do for a living. And, you know, as a, as a musician, but it was a, an incredible education and, and, um, and really did prepare me for what I do. Uh, um, but I didn't want to do that here. I didn't want to be known as that. Right. And, the, you know, the difference, uh, one other difference between the past and, and now that time and now is you can do a lot of different things now where back then you couldn't like even if you if you want to be a session drummer you, you probably didn't want to be known for a tour as being a touring guy first kind of thing or you didn't you didn't want to be known as doing casuals or clubs you know you, you it was it was very specific yeah. you didn't want to do jing you didn't want people to know you were doing jingles if you wanted to do records you know and it was everything was kind of isolated that way and now it's open you know, this land of diversity, you have to be, you have to do a lot of different things. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful about, you know, how things are now. But anyway, but back then I was like, okay, I can't do any of those kind of gigs. And, you know, I don't want to be known for that. I, I need the money. And so I went, I went and did this trust fund gives it a juvenile hall. And this bass player and I just got along really well. It was really fun. And his name Taras Verdunia, great player. And, uh, he, uh, he goes, I, I do, we do these big gigs, uh, like, you know, dance things. And, 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 you know, we, we, we need a sub sometimes our drummer needs a sub. Would you mind doing it? I thought, okay, maybe I can sub on them. And then I'm not thought of, of, of just doing that. I said, yeah. And I, I, it was very helpful. And uh, I did a few of those and he goes, Hey, I just got this gig, uh, Andy Frazier doing this tour. And, and you know, um, he's not happy with the drummer and, uh, can you, you know, do you want to come and, and audition? And I did. And, and, and so I got hired to do the tour and I loved it. And musically it was great. Andy was great. And, you know, and I also met Bob Marlette, who was the producer and, and, and Bob and I did a lot of records after that. And, um, later on and, uh, but that tour, you know, and it was only supposed to be like a three or four week tour. It ended up being three months, and um, you know, and that that did a lot. And I, I, I wouldn't have gotten that tour if I didn't go play a juvenile hall gig. You know, <sighs> yeah. and you know, for thirty bucks or something. You know, it's like yeah. you know because you know, and and you know, so yeah, you're one hundred percent right. And it, it's really about putting energy out there. The, you know, whatever we're doing, if you're not working, you're not doing something. Whatever you're doing, creating yourself you know, and, and, or, you know, letting people know what you're doing and, and, you know, you're putting that energy out there. For you sure. know? And, and for me, it never comes back in the way I expect it to, or I think it's going to, or what I'm exactly looking for. It's always dressed up a little differently. Yeah. And, um, and usually, you know, a better learning experience than what I was thinking. And, uh, you know, but, but I think it's really, important to be open to you know receiving that to to noticing that yeah. noticing something coming that wait a minute I, I i should do that 
you know, and I should be open to that. And um, because uh, think about how many things should pass you by, you know, how many of those things are maybe happening to us that we, we don't notice, you know, yeah. and so it's, it's, it's really important and important to be always, you know, want to put it out there and even helping other people. I mean, I, you know, I, you don't do it for these, you, do, you need to do things for the right reasons as well. You know, it's not only, Oh, can I get this? Can I get that? Do it because you want to go out and do that, you yeah. know, and you might be uncomfortable, but, but, you know, do, do it for the right reasons, you know, and, and even helping others out, you know, there's a lot of great things that can happen just by being open and helping somebody, you know, Oh, you need something. Sure. Let me come and help and do that. And I, I do that a lot today. You know, it's like, I want to do, I remember hearing again, when I first knew Jeff, Jeff did that a lot, you know, he, new bands or something, he'd go and play for them. He'd, he'd do something to help them and, and, uh, you know, record something. And, and I, you know, I think all that's important. And, you know, this business is a, is a business of relationships. Like you just said, people mm-hmm. you've been working with for 20 years, you know, the people I'm working with here, you know, a lot of the records I'm, I'm doing now, it's been a lot the last, last two years is like people are, or investing in their careers and in yeah. music is, you know, people are really creating and, and, um, you know, the, the producers I'm working with and the things I'm producing, but producers when I'm playing, producers I'm working with, I've been working with for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, you yeah. Know, you're still working together and, and, you know, it's really a, you know, you build those relationships for sure. You know, we still respect each other and, you know, and they're still growing. They're still, Hey, we checked out this, you know, this new plug-in. You check this out. We, you know, everyone's still, you're not just riding on anything, you know. You're not phoning it in. No, you can't do that. I mean, that was one other uh, story real quick. Um, I remember I was I went in one of my big first, some of my first big sessions with this, this commercials. And, and over it, it was called United Western at the time. It's called East West now, yeah. one of my favorite studios. It was one of the first studios I went into in LA and, um, you know, and back then carrying my, my drums in the back and, 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 <laughs> and doing this, doing this, this, the session and nervous as hell, the orchestra and, and, uh, <clears throat> but, um, I remember one point thinking about, I, I, I was thinking about, I was adding up what we made okay this hour that hour and uh you know and 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 then i i remember hearing seeing some people maybe that i kind of respected and seeing that they weren't enjoying music as much at, at this point in their in their life and and then somebody telling me you know you know a lot of people end up doing it for the wrong reasons and doing things that they don't like and they just get jaded and they kind of lose their spirit and i remember thinking about that and go okay i gotta think about this and i don't want to lose my spirit you know right. i did not do certain things but i definitely met, made it a point to make it the balance and do things because i you know for, for the right reasons and and you know sometimes you make some difficult decisions and uh for yourself at, at, you know at, at any given time but but if you if you make that decision for the right reason it'll come back in a good way sure you know and and that's why 40 years later we can still be excited you know yeah. and we're not and we're not jaded you know that's incredible so try, try try your hardest to do something to do things that you enjoy yeah you know for sure. And and it's got to be pretty incredible. You are on my living room television every day as the drummer that played on the theme song to Friends, a cultural phenomenon. One of the are you greatest- watch it every day? I mean, it's it's always on in the back that. there. Yeah, man. You know <laughs> I what I mean? That. I, I know a lot yeah. of the storylines, but that's, you know, sitcoms are kind of like my my guilty pleasure. I'm just a fan yeah. of the of that platform. <laughs> and um, yeah. that's just a great one, man. The storylines still hold up. All the women's fashions still look great. The guys, the baggy shirts and the baggy jackets, that's not really holding up. But uh-huh. tell us tell us that story of I, I know it's a Rembrandt's thing. Uh, what, what was what was that all about? How did that how did that happen? I actually um, 
uh, Danny Wild, I don't want to remember, he was doing his, uh, uh, a solo record. And I, I was playing on his solo record. He was on Geffen Records. And um, I remember, you know, you don't, from my, in my experiences anyway, I, I probably only rehearsed uh, for maybe three different records of my lifetime, maybe, or two. Uh, you don't really rehearse usually, and 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 um, but we were rehearsing for for this record, and he his he brought his demos in, and he had done, done himself drum machine and stuff. They're great. The demos are great. And I said some I said something during the rehearsal. I said, "What the hell are we doing here? This is great. Just put this out, you know." And um, you know, just complimenting him, and and, and we had a good time doing the record, and then. Uh, um eventually he would he would you know he parted ways with geffen and he you know he started writing and doing the rembrandt's thing and uh and he I remember him calling me up he goes remember those demos you he said were good so i just got a new record deal and uh, off my demos and we're releasing that and that was their big hit and, and um <clears throat> i thought that was so great and then you know uh he called and said we're, we just got called to do uh, a theme for a TV show. And he said, you know, it's kind of like a monkeys thing, you know, like the, you know, the, the, the TV show, the monkeys. Yeah. And when I was a little kid, a little kid just starting to play, it was a little, little room in, the, in our backyard. I go practice in and I would go in to watch the monkeys. And, and when, when it was on, you know, and get inspired by this band on TV. Me too. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And getting those records and, trying to figure out who was singing what. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I, uh, uh, we went and it was just, a, you know, uh, we did that. We just went in that evening and, and I remember the producer was there and, and um, we did the track. It was fast. I remember doing that fast track and it was, it was, it was very monkeys esque energy. And, um, and then we did, uh, some percussion we, we did the claps and um and it was a fun session and then didn't think you know much after that and then then it became pretty successful you know so and, were, the, were those human claps or uh, yeah it was the three of us actually uh amazing those, those two guys and us yeah and the, uh we did them and yeah yeah and uh yeah it was fun we had a great time you know listen they're great great pop writers i mean their melodies are just yeah. amazing it's just you know amazing so, and, so uh, but that got established as the theme and then um if uh, all the interstitial music you know when monica and rachel are coming into a room a bing gong dig go go and did mm -hmm. that go to a producer who had a brought in a different team to do that stuff or did you end up the playing composer. on composer a composer yeah a composer who brought who brought them i think i think actually greg and i were talking about i think greg bissonette played on a lot of those Wait, that, I mean, was that, it I all greg or did it was there multiple drummers i don't know yeah i don't know i know he did some of it and then i was supposed to they called me to do the video and uh and um i was going to japan for that first tour and um and I, w I said yes to the video. It was a week before I was leaving. And then the video got postponed a week, and I had to get out of it. So um, I went to Japan, and I, uh, I was going to meet my my family in Hawaii on a little break in August. I went in June, in August, going to meet them. And so we're in Hawaii. I turn on MTV, which is different than Japan MTV, and and it came on, and that video came on. I'm like, oh wow, this this is out. And it's like, yeah, it's a huge deal here. It's like a, a big hit. And I had no idea because I was oh in Japan. And, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a cool, it's funny, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's funny. A lot of people gravitate toward that. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. You know, when we, it, when we're recording or we're playing live, I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way, you know. We do this, you know, we do this in hopes to, you know, we got so, we get so much out of music, listening to music as a kid. And, and, um, and one reason of wanting to do this is be able to do that for others. And, you know, when you're making records, it's really about, 
you know, if something feels good and, and you just hope that that touches somebody yeah. out there. And, 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 um, so the fact that this touches so many people means, means, means a whole lot. It's you know, incredible. It's, it's pretty cool. I didn't write the song. I just played on it, but, but it's still, but it, still it, that, you know, we, we get that little SAG after AFM check at the beginning of the year for terrestrial airplay and then, and the, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. It's like it, just me playing on the number of hits that I have. It's, I look forward to that check. And then when you break, okay. when, yeah. when the, when the check comes from TV and film, it's always a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so funny. Uh, I've been saying that uh, uh, lately, you know, you know, getting older and you think about, you know, retirement in the next whatever, 15 years, whatever. And, and you go, um, and I look at that and, you know, the special payments, uh, special payments on, for records for, for, for me. And I was, I wanted to do records more than, film. I did a lot of film in TV, but, 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 but I, I focus way more on records. I really, right. really want what I want to do, and and film and TV stuff is more of the songs, <clears throat> and and uh, and so or some themes, and uh, but you know, in the special payments, you know, and you know, twenty years ago was 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 a lot more than than the, the TV and film, and but now, but that was all on record sales, so yeah, you know, record sales, right? So those special payments that were they were pretty substantial um or not substantial anymore and and the tv film is a lot more especially now with streaming and yeah. it's happened like the last four or five years six years it's it's they it's all gone up and yeah. and um and i and so i like the other day i was like oh, damn i wish i would have done more of that <laughs> you know it's like if i would have realized that well when i'm 80 years old that would really help you know, but, yeah, uh, yeah. but, but, um, but again, you know, you do things for the reasons you want to do them. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been the right thing to do, but, um, but I, I appreciate them a lot. I appreciate that a lot. I, I, you know, that's the one, one thing that, that, that's going to be missing for future is, you know, a lot of that's going away. A lot of the, the union stuff is going away. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> and that was a very, a very helpful thing, you know, for, you know, uh, for, for, for all of us. And, you know, I, the, the, the film and TV industry seems to have a a better handle on, on the shifting trajectory of, you know, everything and streaming and then, than the record business did. Hey, Denny, uh, since I, since I air drum to it every night is, did you have three toms on the song or two? Was it just a little ringo? Because you go through second gear, and it, yeah. Uh, was, uh, but then there's a bridge part where it's like a yeah. I think that I think it's three toms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think back then, back then I was probably using the, the two mounted toms in the floor. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll be air drumming it to uh, to later this evening. Uh, but I don't want I don't, I don't want to keep you too long, man. But I was just going to ask about um, you. Uh, I believe wrote a, a rock opera, staring into uh, nothing. I, I produced. I produced it. It was. Uh, um, it was. Uh, uh, it was written by uh, Steve Rogers and Kirk Barabas, the uh, songwriters, um, <clears throat> and uh, they have. Um, had this kind of progressive rock band and i i got they called me who was it about a year and a half ago um almost two years ago i guess may it'll be two years um and they uh again one of those things a lot of times you get i get certain emails that come into a website and i just like don't know what it is and i if i don't know I, I don't do a lot of work w- unless that's like kind of out of the industry, like somebody I know kind of is involved in it in, in, in a way. And um, so sometimes, you know, you may not follow up on something And this. I did, and I'm, I'm glad I did. I looked at it and I, and I, I contacted them and they said, Hey, you know, they contacted me and said, you know, we'd like you to take a listen to music and see if you want to produce this. We'd really like you to, to be able to, to produce this. And, it's a concept record. And I, I like concept records. It's like, if you're going to do a full record today, I think that's even, I think it's a really smart thing anyway, have a, you know, a concept behind it. And, um, 
you know, to, to make people listen to all the songs because people are so used to listening to one at a time now. And uh, so um, I listened to it was like 20 some songs and, and uh, I said, yeah, I think I could, I could help with this. And um, so uh, we went in, we went into East West and I got Bruce Watson Warner and, and we do a lot of stuff together. I, I love him. I got him to come in and, we did it, you know, we, we did this record and we did 22 songs and, uh, and then, uh, we went to the band studio to finish them off. And then I got, um, I got Mark and Kip Lennon from, uh, you know, the band Venice. Love that band. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I got them to do the, uh, all the background vocals. And, uh, and so, um, I came in and, and we made this really cool concept record and it was really about, you know, um, uh, about, you know, modern technology and, you know, it's really asked the question, is it good? Is it not good? You know, what, what, what does it do? And staring into nothing is kind of like, you know, we, I, I don't know about you, but I catch myself sometimes, you know, I'm waiting for somebody and, or I'm, you know, you know, I, my, my fiance goes, go, you know, it, is trying something on or something and i and I'm, I'm looking at my phone and comes out oh everything good and so yeah i said i have no idea what i was looking at you know it's just literally, literally staring into nothing you know i put it away now i don't even, i i try not not to do that but um anyway we you know a, a lot a lot of the songs you know I, I thought was pretty relatable and get people things to think about and uh so at the end of it you know they're going what are we gonna you know they're they're older guys and they're going you know what are we going to do with this? You know, and you know, it's, it's, it's definitely classic rock kind of, kind of record. And, and, you know, if we put it streaming with, you know, what's that going to do? And, and uh, so, um, you know, is, and they said, you know, is there any way we can do some kind of play? And I said, well, this would make a great rock opera. And, um, and, uh, and the way we put it together kind of, kind of worked that way. And I said, great, let's do it. And the financer said, yeah, let's do this. Will you produce it? I'm like, okay, that's just like a big record, I guess. And, uh, and so, um, and then I was musical director and played on it. And, um, and it was a great experience, a great learning experience for me. And it's something, you know, I want to do more of anyway. So, you know, it, it, it was a, you know, again, one of those things that came out of the blue, nothing I was looking for at all. When they contacted me, I was really concentrated on writing and, and um, really wanted to start doing soundtracks. And, uh, and it, it took me this different direction. And again, you just kind of, I'm glad I was open to hearing it. Yeah. And cause I learned a lot. It was a great experience and, um, you know, a lot of moving parts to it. And, um, and, there were times, I mean, it was, I was literally up at five in the morning answering emails and working <laughs> until, you know, and, uh, and wearing all those hats, you know, and, uh, and at the time it was like, now it's like, oh yeah, that's easy. I can do that. You know, you get away from it. It's like, now I know what I'm doing. Um, but it, you know, it was a great learning experience and, um, it came out great and we did a, a, a full on production. They had a live band on stage, great musicians, uh, nine piece cast, I think. And, uh, and they were great. And at the end of it, as hard as it was, at the end of it, it was so gratifying, you know, just to see this thing come alive and, and the people react to it and, and to see the actors, you know, these, these, uh, you know, come alive and, and have fun with it and see what, you know, this thing evolve. But, really nice we're like yeah i'll do this again you know it's awesome man congratulations yeah yeah yeah, it's fun it's really fun they want to uh look for some other uh to add some more performances so we'll be putting something together we'll probably be bettering it and doing some things and uh but uh yeah it's a great experience great people working on it Mm. Yeah. Fantastic, man. And I, I, I had a family thing come up at the time it was it was horrible timing but uh were you able to go to the uh, dw 50th party yes i did and uh uh yes i did i went with friend uh, rich lambert and we uh um we went and that was it was great it's right down the street from me yeah uh, i literally walked to it and that's, uh, that's awesome um it was great and 
Yeah, it was great to see everybody. It was nice. It was really nice. Fantastic. Man. Really nice. Yeah. Well, I don't want to keep you too long, man. It's a, we're, I love we're, those guys. I, I, I mean, you're, you're a long term. Yeah, I've been w. there. I've been there uh, 13 years, I believe. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think I joined. I think it was 87. That's and, a, that's um, great. It was it was that that drum kit thing, right? It's like uh, uh, on the Belinda tour, uh, my tech, Jeff Alcaltree was like, man, you need some new drums for this tour. No, I like my drums. I had Rogers and he goes, come with me. And we went down there. And at the time they were using color shells. I didn't know it. And I hit drums. I love these. And that's when it started. And I love them. You know, they're, they're just um, creative, dedicated people. You know? Oh, it's incredible. Just like no, no stone is left unturned and the innovations. Yeah. And of course, the people. And this year, I'm so excited. The last four years, I've had a black matte kit uh, with the black rim. So it's my Darth Vader kit. Um, mm -hmm. But this year, I'm going with the Gad and I'm taking out a gorgeous piano black. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Just the classic. Yeah. I always wore used black. I remember John Good at one time going, Will you please let us make you something other than black? You know, I know I'm not I just I love it but I love it I I'm love black it. or yeah. red or black and red I said but I'm yeah. never gonna be the guy that plays yellow or lime green drums man I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah 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 it's never yeah. you know um yeah. well, well thank you so much for your time man it was uh, you're oh, a definite a kindred spirit and definitely an inspiration to so many congratulations on a multi-decade career in the wild west that we call the music business man yep yep pretty yeah. incredible it's, it's a great business I uh I say if you if you love it and you want to do it, do it. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. people can uh, find you, DennyFungheiser.com and SonicBlissMusic.com. And, uh, man, I really appreciate your time, and I will keep in touch. And if I am in sunny Los Angeles, we can go get an overpriced kale smoothie together. That sounds great. <laughs> all right. Awesome, man. And, hey, to all the listeners out there, you guys, we sure appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review the show. It helps people find us. And we will be here. Until next time, thank you so much. Denny, thanks, man. All right. All right. Thank you, Rich. You have Appreciate a wonderful you. day. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.